Hello and welcome. My name is Eric Fleming and this is my presentation on designing fault tolerant services. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. The first thing we're going to talk about is why. In other words, why go through all the trouble of designing a fault tolerant service? Well, some systems deal with inherently critical data. So think about aircrafts or self-driving cars, there are a multitude of mathematical computations that need to execute so that the vehicle can go about its uh, way and r arrive at the target destination safely. If for some reason a calculation isn't processed correctly, it could send the vehicle into an unresolved state, you know, and that could and that failure in the state could result in a dangerous situation for the passengers involved. Also with medical devices, uh, we need to make sure that we're getting data reliably, especially if uh, we're in the ER or in the ICU. Uh, these medical readouts are going to be able to make sure that we have a correct understanding of the patient's current condition, and that's going to allow our medical professionals to provide the best service possible. And of course, uh, one of the, you know, so let's say largest users of fault tolerant programming is going to be the banking, the financial institutions. You know, we need to make sure that these transactions are happening in a timely manner. We need to make sure um, that money is flowing so that businesses, you know, around the world can execute what they do and of course they can't do that without funds so it really is you know one of those systems that um, underlies a lot of other systems so it, it needs to be very fault tolerant. Also just in general um, as I was talking about when reliability is the key to your business you know when you have very little downtime whenever you need us we're there we'll give it to you you know if that if the now, 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 if the response time is really key, you know, you're going to want to make sure that your service is tolerant to faults. So when you decide as an organization to build a fault tolerant service, there are direct and indirect goals that are going to be achieved through this. Of course, I just spoke a lot about reliability and reputation. Uh, but in going through how you're going to design your new fault tolerant service, you're also going to have to improve its scalability and its flexibility. Now, of course, these are goals that you would want to have, um, and that's a good thing. So designing your system with fault tolerance in mind naturally lends itself to scalability. This is because for systems to be reliable, uh, they're going to have to necessarily be redundant. And so that means that our architecture is going to have to, at its core, be scalable, or at least amenable to increases in scale. Also, because we're going to have so many different uh, services either running in parallel or in sequence, this is going to increase our software's ability, our services ability to be flexible. Either we can keep chaining things or we can reorder the precedence of them and that's going to again increase the flexibility of our service. So it's called fault tolerant services, which means uh, we're going to have to have a little bit of background information on some faults that we can expect to see, and then later we'll talk about you know what are some designs that'll go about handling these different types of faults, of course. So by definition, fault tolerant services are software with the ability to detect and recover from a fault that has happened in the system in order to provide service in accordance with the specification. It's important to understand that this is not the same as uh, error handling. Uh, we really want to see faults as a, as a much broader um, scope of failure in the system as opposed to just, you know, we were given an input and the output didn't do it, didn't fall within the range. So now we have this error. Of course, that's kind of a large category of software bugs in general, but it's not just limited to that. So I just wanted to bring that up.
also availability of the service is going to be sort of your measure for success. All right. So some more definitions. Faults are the root cause of errors in the system that bring about service failure. Failure could mean an incorrect result in addition to no result. So that's often people think of no result as a failure, but you know, if you're if the data that people thought they were getting isn't actually accurate, that, that's also a failure. And there are three main classes of faults that we could run into as a service provider. So the first would be a physical fault, and you know these are things that just happen over time. Physical meaning hardware faults, either due to natural phenomena or human actions. So either there's a power outage in the data center or there is some physical damage to the machine that's running the service. These would be our physical faults. Then there's the faults that we make, development faults. So this means incorrect algorithmic design baked into the service. Uh, inputs were not properly validated. There were some missing edge cases perhaps that we didn't handle. Or perhaps when we first designed the service, you know, it was synchronous, but now it's scaling, it's asynchronous, there's a lack of awareness on the prevalence of data races, on thread safety, just good concurrent uh, software practices. And the final class of faults would be interaction, which tend to deal with uh, deployment faults. So perhaps you've updated a bunch of servers, but you know, one of them is misconfigured. So there's some environment variables that are just not what they should be. Um, your dependencies aren't up to date, so you're calling a future dependency that doesn't exist on one machine. And it only has a past dependency, and that causes a fault. Or perhaps there are some bad actors that are sending malicious actions to the service. These actions then trip our security measures, and the security measures then trigger faults in the system. So these are our classifications of uh, faults that could arise. So of course, you know why we're all here. The strategy is uh, how do we go about designing these fault tolerant uh, behaviors in our services? So what can we do about it? Well, first, uh, you could just retry. So you have a server running the service, you get a fault, you say, ah, maybe it was a fluke, uh, let's run it again and see what happens. Of course, you don't want to do this indefinitely, that's going to create a bottleneck, you're going to want to have a max limit, uh, preferably lower as opposed to higher, because we do have other strategies that are more robust. Uh, again, this is best for transient errors uh, or for highly contended resources. So in other words, you tried to do something, oh, someone else is using it, I can't touch it right now, concurrency. Uh, let me just try again in a little bit. Uh, a second strategy would be active replication. So in other words, you have multiple copies, not exact copies of the service, I will add, but multiple instances of the service running in parallel. They all give you an output. So uh, from there, you can then choose which output you want to pick. Um, and then that is then sent back to the client. And the last type of general strategy is passive replication. So of course, you have your primary service, your primary server. If it fails, then it falls back to a backup, and your backups could have backups. So these ones operate in sequence as opposed to in parallel. But of course, uh, like most things, it's better to use them in tandem than it is to just use them in isolation. So one of the research papers I looked at uh, looked at how these strategies performed in a hypothetical loan service that just did normal CRUD transactions. And it, it checked uh, what was the average response time. It checked the failure rate. And it also checked how much uh, resources it consumed. We'll see that on the next slide because, again, uh, we're not just providing a service, but it costs money to provide that service. So knowing how much resources you're going to expend is going to be one of the main factors of uh, cost. So uh, as we can see, uh, active replication performed the, uh, the fastest. And that's because, again, um, 
it doesn't have to wait before it triggers that response. So in a retry model, it has to fail once before it can try again. And same thing with passive, it has to fail once before it can try it again. Versus with active replication, you're trying all possibilities at once. And so if one failed, no big deal. You have other people to consult in the future about uh, what happened. So now let's talk about you know some of the computation and the costs associated with each one of these strategies. So the second option, active plus retry, it performed the best, uh, but it did use significantly higher resources. You can see that right here. So active plus retry had much higher resources. However, if you use retry plus passive, uh, this one used the fewest number of resources, uh, but it was significantly slower. So as you can see here, uh, retry plus passive was much slower, uh, but it was only about 12% slower. It did consume uh, three times fewer resources, and again, that's due to some of the generalities baked into the model of active replication. The literature supported that if you're trying to prevent k faults that you're going to need 2k plus 1 services. So for this design you're trying to prevent a fault so 2 times 1 plus 1 is uh, 3. So we've got 3 active services here. So that is one thing to keep in mind. And now that we kind of understand uh, what the general what was the word I used? Uh, what the general strategies are to achieve fault tolerance. Let's talk a little bit more about what the specifics of the architecture would look like when you're actually designing that system. So as we can see with all three strategies that we just looked at, uh, redundancy is the main ingredient to ensure fault tolerance. So a system is redundant when it is capable of executing the same logically unique functionality in multiple ways or in multiple instances. The availability of alternate execution paths or alternate execution environments is the primary ingredient for practically all systems capable of avoiding or tolerating faults. Now, as we saw in both the uh, retry, the active, and the passive, your architecture needs to know whether or not the service has faulted and the component that does that is called the adjudicator. So no matter what strategy you use, an adjudicator component sits between your service and the client. The job of the adjudicator is to determine if the fault has occurred and how to resolve it. The design of your adjudicator depends on the strategy that you're selecting, aka uh, retry, active, or passive. And then how the adjudicator goes about resolving depends on the type of data that you're handling and, of course, the strategy that you chose. So here are some typical redundancy schemes uh, for adjudicators. There's the N version scheme, a recovery block scheme, and a self-checking scheme. Although the, the self-checking scheme is really for more uh, mature projects that have a, a much greater understanding of um, you know, optimal situations. So we're really going to kind of focus on the first two, and you may want to explore the third one um, as you as you progress in your understanding of fault tolerant services. So N version. So programs designed independently that accomplish the same task. You can see that with C1, C2 through CN, uh, they're executed in parallel. So it's active replication. The goal of each one of the independent services is to be as different as possible in its implementation. You know, that's because what we're trying to prevent here is we're trying to prevent development faults. Of course, if it's a physical fault, um, if you just had identical copies, sure, if one hardware fares, fails, the other hardware will work. Uh, but an end version strategy is really trying to prevent development faults. So the adjudicator is going to resolve its final output, you know, the output from C1, C2, etc., through some type of voting algorithm to compare the results. 
and um, as we discussed, it's good. This is going to be good at present pr mitigating physical faults and uh, development faults. So let's talk about what some of these versions might look like. So suitable candidates for a, a second version may be the old version. Uh, you may need to have some wrapper code in between the old version and the uh, new version so that the I.O. is working as you expect it. Another possible candidate for um, an independent parallel service would be design the service again in another language and that's going to be important because that language is going to depend upon different frameworks and so if there is not a fault in uh, your service but in one of the services that you're depending upon that's probably not going to be reflected in another language or in another uh, framework unto itself and uh, finally for performance benefits you could think about designing your alternate versions perhaps to use different sorting algorithms or to use uh, different data structures in its overall process. You should of course hopefully be designing your you know main service, your original one to be you know optimal sorting or optimal uh, data structures for insertion, retrieval, you know whatever it is that your service is designed to do well. Uh, but it is worth noting that you know you based off of the input that users give you you know these performance benefits that you you thought were happening are maybe not happening and so using different sorting algorithms or data structures um, might be tolerable or, or might be equally as performance as uh, what you thought you were getting so I talked a little bit about the voting mechanisms so in the previous diagram we saw how all of the independent services uh, funneled their outputs to the adjudicator. Now, for numerical situations, you know, if there are discrepancies between the answer, you need to think about if a mean or a median would be appropriate, where the mean is the average value. Um, of course, my background is in math, so you know, I'd say, okay, well, there's more than one mean. You know, you've got the arithmetic mean, you got the geometric mean, but um, you know, you you decide which one you want to use. Uh, the median is, of course, the middle value, so th that's trying to strip out outliers. Typically, uh, something in the middle is not going to be an outlying response. You could also just take the, the majority. So uh, say your outputs fall into an array of categories. Uh, which one is half? Which, one, which response is more than half? So that's what I mean by strict. Is it greater than or equal to, or is it uh, just greater than half of the responses? Or uh, this would be honestly the worst case scenario, but I mean, if you're, if you're designing your instances to give you the same result and you have um, your responses, you can't conform that one response is happening over 50%, uh, then you have to kind of fall back to consensus. So in other words, you know, what was the most frequent situation. So imagine your active service has, you know, five services in parallel. You get two responses that are the same, one that's different, one that's different, one that's different. You can see how a majority um, vote would fail there, but the consensus would pick the one that's two. Um, but that's an even larger issue of, I mean, how did you even get that many distinctly different responses to begin with? Um, You've got, you've got some larger errors. So you might be looking at like a 3-2 split right there where majority would also work. Let's talk about the, uh, the second type of architecture to prevent faults, and this would be recovery blocks. So as we can see, each service kind of has its own personal adjudicator. And so a voting model is not going to be how it goes about uh, deciding if it should output to the client or not. Each service is in charge of deciding whether its um, output is valid or not. So this is passive replication. So we're going to assume our first service is always going to work. 
If not, fall back to a backup. If not, fall back to a backup to the backup. So this is passive replication. And the adjudicators in this design are going to revolve around acceptance testing um, to decide what to do with the response. So there's reasonableness acceptance tests, and this means um, based off of what we've seen before, does this output fall into a valid or acceptable range of responses? And uh, for more transactional type of services, uh, we can do accounting acceptance tests. And otherwise, in other words, let's look at the you know the summary statistics before the service was executed. Let's look at the summary statistics after it was executed. Um, is this transaction consistent with producing that change, or did something else change that we expect shouldn't have changed as a result? In other words, this is a fault. We should we should roll it back and we should try again in some alternate design. Uh, similar to uh, end versioning. So for a recovery block strategy, one thing you'll often see is that the, the first fallback is going to be the old version of the service, you know, plus some, some wrapper code. And uh, the third and last one will be a self-checking architecture. So in other words, uh, we have our, our main component and we have spare component. Uh, these are actually all executed in parallel. And this is, again, so that we can receive uh, that performance boost. Um, but it's going to use acceptance testing as opposed to using a voting model. So if the primary one fails, we're going to fall back to the, the backup, and so on and so on. Now, again, um, you're going to need to really be aware of what this idea of acceptance testing is. You're going to have to have a very mature understanding of what the range of acceptable answers are. Otherwise, um, you know, this strategy isn't really going to, to work at all. So if your ranges are, are not properly set, then, you know, it's either it'll bottom out or um, the first one will just always trigger, and uh, you won't actually see these other. You'll be paying for the execution of these other services, but they won't actually be increasing your business value. So that's why this is sort of the most um, mature form of it, um, but you also need to really have a w good understanding of what's possible. So also in my research, I looked at some of the ways that people were able to design systems in order to take advantage of these different mechanisms, these different uh, strategies to be able to produce fault-tolerant services. So let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at some of them. So this was one of the fault-tolerant web services that uh, I thought had a pretty clean diagram and was very understandable. So uh, just taking a look at this, the it's going to start over here in the client, um, and then the client sends a response to the request handler. The, the request handler is, as you can see, it's using active replication here among the servers. There's a fault detector. Um, that's going to be able to determine if one of these is not performing correctly. Uh, all of these get sent to, it says voter here, but you, you want to also think about that as the adjudicator because it's just using a voting strategy. So uh, once that happens, it's going to send it over to the replication manager. And the replication manager is actually a, a, a passive strategy. So in other words, if we think that one of the servers is having some sort of physical faults, uh, we can replace it with one of the, the backup servers. So again, over here, this active replication is meant to prevent development faults. Um, but in the case that we think it's going to be um, a physical fault, the replication manager can go ahead and say, okay, well, if server one failed, backup server one, uh, you're going to run the same implementation as server one had. And I'm going to, the request handler is going to stop 
send it information here, and it's going to send it to the uh, backup one. And of course, uh, we want to log all of these, all of this behavior in the system, and so that that we can see that the system's working properly, and it can help us improve over time. And the where is it? The log cleaner essentially is just going to go back and. Honestly, anytime something worked from start to finish, it's going to go back and it's going to clean the logs because what we're really only interested in is failures. So um, that is important. And here is essentially just written out uh, what I said, how each of the pieces work in tandem and how they all work together. So here's another design. Uh, this one has a passive strategy in mind, and it's also using recovery blocks. So the consumer contacts the uh, service, the service then logs the response, uh, the monitor is then going to continually be checking the logs to see if there's a fault. So uh, we're going to assume that our first version is going to work. Again, it will uh, log it. And when it sends the response back to the adjudicator, uh, we're going to see if it, you know, we're, we're using acceptance testing here. So we're going to see if it, if it passes the test. If not, the monitor is going to catch it, and then it will send it to version 2. Now version 2 may require some type of data transformation, as we were talking about earlier, because likely um, your first fallback is just going to be the previous version of the service, and so you might need to have some wrapper transformations on it and if the second one fails uh, the, the, the monitor will check the logs and it'll send it to there um, but we're hoping that one of these returns a, a valid response and then it gets sent back to the client. And again here is just a description of all of the pieces in that architecture um, but I kind of went through and described the process about how it goes about achieving fault tolerance and uh, the types of mechanisms that it was using to do so. So conclusions. So we want to design fault tolerant services uh, when we're really concerned about reliability, when we're really concerned about service availability. Your design should be informed on your business requirements and the big choices that you're going to need to make as an architect are, you know, are we looking at a retry model, uh, active replication, passive replication, or some combination of the two? We saw that one of the architectures used both active and passive replication. And in some of the modeling schemes, we saw that um, it used retry and active and retry and passive, so all combinations were explored. You need to think about are we executing our fault tolerance strategy in parallel or uh, sequentially? This is going to inform how your adjudicator works, so if it's in parallel you're going to need uh, most frequently some type of voting model or if it's operating in sequence you're going to need some type of acceptance testing. Although we did see that the, the most advanced version um, that was called uh, self-correcting that actually used a parallel strategy with acceptance testing. And then finally, you as the architect need to compare the computation cost versus the time. We saw how active mechanisms were the most computationally intensive, i.e. Uh, gave you the highest cost, but they also uh, responded the, the quickest, so you were able to get a correct response the fastest. However, if, if time isn't your concern, you, you might want to try a more passive sequential approach to it. Uh, that's all. Here are my references, and thank you, and I hope that you learned a lot from this presentation.